Uh, the first scripture reading this morning, which we will read in unison, is from Psalm 118, <coughs> verses 19 to 24. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you. And I'd like to invite the children forward. We're going to meet on the front pew. Good to see you all. So what's the name of this game? Jenga. For some reason, this is my husband's favorite game. I, 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 do you like to play this game? Yeah. All right. So first of all, I started it, you see. You have a game just like it. Yeah. You play this at your home. Very nice. Us too. So I, I want to know that if it falls over, will you help me pick it up? Yeah. Okay. And we're going to put it in the basket. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. All right. So do I have a volunteer? Okay. Jack, you want to come? Jack, he, he, did, he did that extra little. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So just. Stuck. Yeah, see if you can. I, I took all the easy ones just so you know. Good job. <laughs> you got to put it on the top. Okay, one more, one more. Um, Isa, I saw you first. Okay. I know. I'll send it. I'll, I'll send it into the Sunday school room with you. Okay. Here, I'm going to make it a little hard for you. Good job. I kept it on top. I'm not touching it. I'm not touching it. Really good. Pass, no, no, no. We're getting, we're get, we the service, the shirt, this worship service will take forever. So watch me. Ready? And all right. Okay. I know. I know. Pass, pass. All right. So why am I doing this? Any, I am doing this. Thank you. All right. Because in our scripture passage, it talked about, um, a cornerstone, when you're going to build a building, like that's a tower, right? The, the placement of the first stone, the cornerstone is really, really important, right? Because it will determine every other stone that you build, right? So like pretend you were like, because this is a nice square edge right there. That, that would be a bad, wouldn't be a bad placement for it, right? Because it's, it goes straight that way in this tree. But if we did that, right? Then it would be off kilter, right? So the very first stone is the most important that you place. They call it the cornerstone. And um, when they used to build buildings, they would use natural rocks and natural stones. So they would be very, very selective about what stone that they would choose because it would determine how the rest of the building turned out. Does that make sense? Right? Because you would want it to be just absolutely perfect. And it taught in the passage that we're um, going to read from the New Testament, we just read one from the Old Testament, talks about Jesus being the cornerstone, like um, on which the church is built. And that the church is actually, the church is actually people, right? <laughs> some of you are going to get this and some of you aren't. But everything that we do here should be based on Jesus and Jesus' teachings, Right? If we, if we stray from that, if we, do, if we try to do other things, then things get wonky and things don't go right. But if we remember that Jesus is like the cornerstone, that he's like the most important piece of everything that we do, then things turn out okay. Does that make sense? Okay. That was a long way. That was a long way to get to that point. 
but that's, but that's what it means to, for Jesus to be the cornerstone. And it says in the New Testament that he was rejected at first, and we know that, but he is the most, but we have, we have learned that he is the most important thing. That's why we come together, because of Jesus. Will you say a prayer with me? And we're going to pray for Mrs. Walsh, too. Look at all of you. All right, let's fold our hands, bow our heads, close our eyes. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for being uh, the reason for us coming together, for being so good. Um, help us to always look to you. And I pray that this school year here in Sunday school, and thank you for all our, our teachers, including Mrs. Walsh, uh, would be blessed that it's a good year, and also for the school years in the regular classrooms uh, or at home, wherever anybody is learning, Lord. We pray, pray that this is a good year, a peaceful year, a year where we grow uh, in, in our smarts, uh, but also in the way that we can grow closer to you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second scripture lesson comes from Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 22. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is the resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they numbered about 5,000. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Anas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all, who, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? And they had just healed a man. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, it has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. When they saw the man who had been cured standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they ordered them to leave the council while they discussed the matter with one another. They said, what will we do with them? For it is obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. But to keep it from spreading further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them again, they let them go. And finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all of them praised God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing had been performed was more than 40 years old. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Martin Luther King Jr. believed in nonviolent resistance. He studied under Gandhi, uh, who taught nonviolence. He thought it was the only way to bring about lasting change. He organized a movement that taught people to resist authorities in, in nonviolent ways. And they practiced in the basement of churches. They practiced. You will be yelled at and mocked. You cannot respond. You will be beaten. Do not hit back. You will be jailed, imprisoned. 
be prepared. Within the civil rights movement, there was something called the Poor People's Campaign, which in recent years has, has there's an attempt to resurrect this Poor People's Campaign. And I was in, invited to a, a training in nonviolent resistance, which I went to a, a, a few years ago, a couple years ago, who knows, time. And we practiced. And then part of the, the, the training, we were told women, you need to remember that if you are arrested, you may be strip searched and it may be invasive. And I thought, I'm out. Lord knows I have issues about being, so, about sovereignty over my own body. Uh, if we had the opportunity, I, I know women in this room have stories to tell. I have my own. And I thought, gosh, I would have to believe wholeheartedly in something in order to be willing to go through that. And then we read our scripture passage. Peter and John get arrested. <laughs> they weren't looking for it. They healed a man and taught about Jesus. Are you, O oh Theophilus, Theophiluses, uh, the book of Luke and Acts, and I'm starting a sermon series on the book of Acts. We're jumping to chapter 4 because it fits for today. Theophilus means a friend of God or a lover of God. So we are all Theophilus. Are you, Theophilus, willing to put your life, your body, your freedom on the line for the sake of the gospel? The disciples, the early apostles, were all in. We talked about that last week. But they learned early on that just talking about Jesus was going to bring resistance. Change brings resistance. We've talked about this too. All conflict, uh, all, all change brings conflict. All ideas of change bring resistance. And I've been in too many places to remember what stories I have told or not told. And I said, have I told the story? I don't remember, but I'm going to tell it again if, if, if you have. When my sister started dating or got engaged with Lenny, who's my, been my brother-in-law for however many years, you, know, you start have to share holidays, right? <clears throat> and my mother says, oh, it's okay. We'll just celebrate Christmas on Christmas Eve. And I was like, wait, ah, no, no. I don't want to change. <laughs> and then I loved it. I was so you got to sleep in on Christmas Day. I was like, yes, this is awesome. But I was not happy, and I tried to sabotage that. More serious example, alcoholism, alcoholics. Alcoholics, if you have an active alcoholic in your family, they're there in body, but emotionally they're not present, available to the family. And when they get sober which is a change for the good, it's fascinating, and this is really, this is really typical. The, the person who gets sober suddenly wants to be active in the family and has opinions and wants to help lead, and the rest of the family is like, you have got to be kidding me. For all these years, you, you know, have been you know, married to that bottle, and suddenly you're going to show up and be my mom? Suddenly you're going to show up and be my dad? I don't think so. And then the difficulty of that situation, right, when suddenly you're like, gosh, my life is a mess, can, not always, but can have the alcoholic escape back into the bottle. And that's what it is. It's an escape to not have to deal with, to numb yourself out to the reality. So even if it's a change for the good, we can sabotage it. Not, not to, you know, and that's, they should teach people, and I think they do, this, this could very well happen. It's worth it, and you're going to have to plow through it to get your life back, but this is what we do. When I talk with, with pastors in teaching and training different pastors, I said, you are going to give your all to help grow a church and help it to thrive, and just so you know, there will be resistance. There will be sabotage because we resist change. And every church will say, no, 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 we want, you know, we want to grow, we want to thrive, but we don't want to change anything. Was it Einstein who said that, you know, uh, it's madness to keep doing the same thing and expect a different result? But we do it all the time, and not just in church, and in, in, in everywhere. You know, we just, 
you know, or, or we want people come, to, to come in, but we want them to do what we've always done. Please don't change anything. Right? And, or you know, I was just talking with the pastor this week, and this church has ideas about what they want to do. I'm like, if you already have a full plate and they want to do new stuff, then you have to negotiate with them, okay, what, what can I let go of in order to embrace this so that, so that he's not burning out as a pastor, right? And so what doesn't get the attention that did get the intention, and <laughs> right? It's human nature. The church resists change of John and Peter, even if it's for the better. They healed a man, and they told him to stop doing it. The writer of Acts makes it clear that these two uneducated men stood before the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, who maintained order in the temple precinct and ranked just below the high priest in authority. The Sadducees, who were opposed to the, the, to the theology of resurrection, which was, would also imply that God is coming soon is going to get things right, and because they were part of the, the aristocratic class uh, and temple priesthood, which is to say they liked how things were. They don't want things turned on its head. They resist. The rulers, the elders, the scribes, Anas the high priest, Caiaphas, the son-in-law to Anas, John and Alexander, two dudes who we don't know who they were, and all who were of the high priestly family were all in attendance for the questioning of these two simple men, an absolutely intimidating crowd. But Peter and John spoke with boldness. They told their story. Jesus had told them earlier in Acts, you will be my witnesses. And they say here in verse 20, we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. And that's all that we're asked to do is to tell our stories, to witness to what we have seen and heard. I shared a story once of answered prayer. It was for uh, the significant other of a parishioner, and he wasn't quite buying the whole Jesus thing. And I shared a story of answered prayer, and and, and his response is, well, that could have just been coincidence, or you could have just convinced yourself that that was God, or you you were looking for something like that, so that's why you think it was God. And I'm like, yeah, I, I believe it was answered prayer. I believe it was God. We have no control over the effect it has on other people. We are called to tell our stories. That's it. Growing up in the church, my church would have different uh, evangelists come from time and again. There was a really funny comedian, Mike Warnicke. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He was a Christian comedian. And, oh, my gosh, he was so funny. And I looked him up not too long ago, and I found out that... um, that uh, they discovered that a lot of what he was telling was lies. It wasn't just, you know, Tony Campolo is a Christian evangelist. His son said, everything that happened to, t- to my father is true, but he just remembers things big. Right? But they find out with Mike Warnicke that a lot of it wasn't true, which is a shame. A lot of our, they, they don't have to be big stories. They can be small stories. But there are stories. One of the incredible blessings of being a pastor is that people trust me with their stories. Afraid, you know, some folks are afraid that they might be laughed at, but with me, they can trust me with their stories. In authentic ways with people that with whom we have relationship. You don't have to be telling your story on the street corner. But with folks who you know and love, make sure that they know your stories. I've often asked people to, and I was talking with a friend about this, that people are, have, are challenged by when asked to articulate how they have experienced God in their lives. A lot of people will say, we'll talk about the church, and as a reminder, God works through the church. So that phone call you get, the love you felt, the support you needed, that's God at work in your life through the church. You know, and it terrifies people like, to share their faith because they think, oh, what if they ask me questions I don't know the answer to? We're not called to argue theology. And uh, when, I, when I went to seminary, we went to, this is, uh, we went to the, in this pub, and we sat around the table, and somebody ordered a, a pitcher of beer, and we were talking theology. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm no longer drinking, but at the time, I thought, I'm in heaven. 
to get to, to talk about theology, you know, and in, in this way and, and argue. But that's when you're with people of faith. That's when you're, you're, you're saying, oh, you're, you're Calvinism and oh, you're Wesleyan, you know, that's. But all we are called to do is tell our stories, tell our stories of faith. For John and Peter, they were told, stop teaching in the name of Jesus. And they said, how can we not tell our stories? And the man who they healed in the name of Jesus stood there, and they all knew him. Forty years, he had been lame, and they didn't know what to say. Here's a few simple but wonderful stories. Sue got sober because she found her higher power in the church of Jesus Christ. Mary found support after her divorce, emotional, financial, spiritual, in the church of Jesus Christ. Ted found a gospel that compelled him to make Matthew 25 his life's work, and the model for how he would be a a physician. When did I see you hungry or thirsty or without clothing? Robin, different Robin, found acceptance and love in a world that found her odd and excluded her at every turn. But at church, she found love, and church was her home. Maria, who is on the spectrum, fell in love with liturgy. And she would say everything just a little slower and a little louder than everybody else. And the Sunday that I invited her forward to help me serve the elements, and when she said, this is the body of Christ broken for you, to everyone in the congregation, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And I had somebody come up to me after service and say, that was one of the most beautiful things I have ever experienced. Thank you for that. These are some of the stories of the people that I've gotten to met pastor over the years. What is your story? Tell it boldly. For their salvation in the name of Jesus. After worship, we're going to be moving into the fellowship hall to be telling stories. And I'm reading this outstanding book called Another Way, Living and Leading Change on Purpose. I should say you a little another subline without getting killed. <laughs> but this is this is why we're why we're telling stories. Scripture reminds us that there is a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. This metaphor and expanded sense of community includes our ancestors, those who have come before us, and our progeny, those who will come after us. One's purpose, and this we're, it's all to discern what is our purpose as a church. One's purpose is not derived solely from the whims of one's own ambition, gifts, and aspirations. Instead, it evolves out of the community's web of mutuality. In community, we acknowledge our inheritance of the past and of the past and the promise of the future. We discern the needs, hopes, and dreams for our common life together in community and the broader world. We affirm that each person has a role to play, and we anticipate that the gifts and purpose of each person will be made known, nurtured, and celebrated. Our vocation, which is to say our purpose lived out over time, is not always limited to our own occupation of time and space. It reflects also the hopes and dreams of those who've come before us, including the unanswered dreams of previous generations. Thus, discerning our purpose is an ongoing act of retrieval, retrieving the best of the past and nourish the seeds, and nourishing the seeds of the future. That's why we're doing it. That's what we get to do today. We read scripture to retrieve the seeds of the past, to plant and nourish the seeds into the future. So we will tell our stories. You will tell your stories to retrieve the seeds of the past, to plant today for a future harvest with Jesus as the cornerstone, and to God be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.